All right. Mm, that's it for that. Uh, we're going to jump into our teaching for the day then. If you'd like to grab a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 14. That's where we're going to land today, Exodus 14. If you didn't bring a paper Bible and you'd like to use one, there are paper Bibles spread throughout the auditorium. You can grab one of those if you'd like to, but every other seat or so. Or you can go to sermons.church on a browser on your device and search for Cornerstone Church and all the scriptures, fill in the blanks, will be there for you. Interactive message notes are available there. And to get us started today, I want to begin by bringing up a couple of photos on the screen. Uh, these are actually photos that, uh, of, of a boating day that my family and I did this last summer. Uh, we actually do it every single summer with my aunt and uncle. Uh, we've been doing it for years and years and years, and it's, it's an absolute blast. Um, and I bring these pictures up to talk about them a, a little bit. Uh, so you can, the family's over here on the left. And then uh, I like to kneeboard. I don't know if you guys have kneeboarded, but I love kneeboarding. I love to jump the wake and go crazy and all that kind of stuff. I had another one that I was like literally off the water. It was awesome. Um, so I love to kneeboard. Uh, my uncle let my son drive his boat. I don't know why he did that, but he did. Uh, and then, uh, but I'm, I, I'm also what I would consider an aggressive tuber. So if you tube with me, as you can see, uh, Leah is on the tube in the center, and then I'm on top of that tube as well. Uh, so I might jump on your tube with you. Uh, I'm, uh, I might surf over you. Uh, I might like literally rip you off the tube. Uh, I might actually kick the tube like that's Elijah over here. I literally kicked him off the tube. I'm kind of an aggressive tuber. So needless to say, my children like really tubing with their mom, right? <laughs> they don't really like tubing with me. Actually, Elijah and I do have a little bit of fun out there as well. Um, but I thought about the, this, this particular uh, event this last summer, because again, we do it every summer. We just pick a day on the lake. Uh, because, and I bring this up because of where we're headed today, which is to look at a story of a day on a lake. And not so much actually like, particularly, it's actually we're going to look at the story of the Red Sea. Some of you may know that story, so it's not so much a lake. But we're going to take a look at uh, a story of a day on a lake, which unlike the poor man's day of fun on the boat, uh, wasn't so much fun for the Israelites, but does involve something kind of cool happening. And that is a miracle happens, which I think will give us some great insights today to discuss so that maybe we, like they did, can experience some miracles in our lives. How many of you would like to experience more miracles? Like I would. I want to experience more miracles. And so I think there's some things in here today to, that we might see that they uh, went through to kind of maybe uh, take from their, this lesson and this story so that we can maybe do that. So if you're not aware, we are currently in a message series here at Cornerstone called The Departure, A Trek Requiring True Grit. And what we're doing is we're walking through the uh, Israelites' exodus, departure out of Egypt, and uh, kind of looking at some of the main topics, ideas uh, of, the, of what they've experienced. So how do we take that into our today? And today we're going to finally get to the part of the journey. We've kind of been setting the stage over the last couple of weeks uh, in, in what we've been sharing. But we're finally at the part of the story where they indeed are starting their departure. They're on the journey. They're leaving Egypt, okay? And uh, as we looked last week, and if you weren't here last week, go back online and, and check out that message. I think it was an important one about obedience to God. But God brought about a plague, uh, the final plague upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians. We looked at that last week. And uh, through what was known as the Passover for the Israelites, which, by the way, if you didn't get your wood piece last week, we're making those. We'll have those available, I think, next week, okay? Um, but we, it was the Passover for the Israelites. But for the Egyptians, uh, it was actually a spirit of death that came across Egypt, right, and killed all the firstborn sons and animals every. It was kind of a big deal. This was a massive thing. And then Pharaoh, finally, because this was like the whole attempt of these plagues was to get Pharaoh to release the Israelites, to let them go, right? And so Pharaoh finally lets them go as God's Could you try again? God desires. I was getting too, too crazy about this message, right? Um, and so Pharaoh finally lets these people go, right? And, and how, what God desires. And this is where we're going to pick up the story today. And it's actually interesting because Pharaoh is not letting go very easily. All right, so let, let's look at Exodus chapter 14. We're gonna start in verse five. It says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. Skip to verse nine. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Hahoroth, opposite Baal Zephron. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. 
They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. Sorry, dry ground. Skip to verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all the night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and a wall on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Skip to verse 25, just a few more verses. The Lord jammed the wheels of the chariot so that they had difficulty driving. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. So our title this morning is The Departure, A Day at the Lake. And we're going to focus on a couple of keys that I see in this text to ultimately experience more miracles, more good stuff in our lives. Like we see, they got to walk through, quite literally, got to walk through this miracle. They got to walk around, uh, walk down uh, over the sea in dry ground. And so I want to give those things to you, some, some keys that I see that we might need to implement in our lives so that we too can see more miracles. So to do that, I'm going to pray first, and then I'll give those to you. So if you would pray with me. So God, we, uh, we do thank you this morning to that we get an opportunity to come in and, and worship you. Um, God, I, I thank you for that last song, just the fact that, God, we can trust you. You won't fail us. And we even see this in our story, that you didn't fail. I pray, God, that ultimately, that as we take a look deeper into this story in the book of Exodus um, and what this might mean for us and how we take this from here into our lives out, outside of this, the, the walls of this building, God, I pray that um, you would do something supernatural among us. God, that you would teach us, mold us, shape us back into the original creation that you've created us to be. And not because of my efforts today, but solely because of the power of the Holy Spirit among us. We invite you into every nook and cranny of this next few minutes together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, two points today to experience more miracles in our lives. Here's the first one. Experiencing a miracle might require less whining. Less whining, all right? Um, now, I will say that, uh, that as we continue on in the rest of the story of the Israelites, we're gonna see this actually happen quite a bit through the Israelites, but this is kind of the first time we see this, so I wanted to make sure to point it out in this particular uh, ser- uh, sermon this morning. Um, but I see this in verses 11 and 12, which showcases the Israelites seriously whining. It says in verse 11, just to remind us, 11 and 12, they said to Moses, Look at this whole rant. It says, was it because there are no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. If I can sum up what that says, it says this, wah, wah, wah. Like they are just being a whiner's. The Israelites are whining, and, and here's the crazy thing. They haven't even really left yet, right? Um, like, uh, like Pharaoh is not that far off. I mean, he's going to actually catch up with them. So they, they're not even that far on the journey, and, and all they're doing is whining. I was actually thinking this week, it's like some of you, uh, when you're kind of getting ready for the day with your children, or maybe if you're an aunt or uncle or something, maybe you've had this experience. Maybe some of you had this experience this morning. And you get your kids ready, you're trying to, and like you're not even in, like you're barely in the car, not even out of the driveway, and whining is on level 10 right? Some of you laugh because you've been there, right? So this is what's happening with these, like, they're like in the driveway. They haven't even really left yet. And they're like, and, and, and like life has not gotten that bad for them. And yet they are whining. And here's what I love about this, though, as I studied the story this week, though, is that like a good parent, God says this in verse 15. 
He says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. I actually like what the New Living Translation, how it puts it. It says this. It says, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Get moving. I love that. Basically, God's like, knock it off. Move. Right? God doesn't let this whole thing go on too long because he's like, listen, well, he already knows he's going to deal with some other things later on in the story. Right? But ultimately, God's like, like, stop your whining. In my house when I was growing up, it was like, stop, quit your whinging, right? Quit your whining, move on, those kind of things. And so it, it actually made me think of a, a, of a uh, movie clip. And I realized this week that this movie was uh, produced and put out before Zach Rudd was born. Um, so that made me feel real old. Uh, but I, <laughs> but I want to see, see if you remember this uh, movie from a 90s film. Go ahead and take a look at this. Today. Today, today we are going to play a new fun game. It's called Police School. I'm going to be your sheriff. You're going to be my deputy trainees. Oh, come on. Stop whining. Your kids are soft. You lack discipline. But I've got news for you. You are mine now. You belong to me. You're not gonna have your mommy's run behind you anymore and wipe your little douches. Oh no, it's time now to turn this mush into muscles. No more complaining, no more Mr. Kimblip to go to the bathroom, nothing. There is no bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how many of you guys remember that movie? Raise your hand, say it out loud. Kindergarten, yes, Kindergarten Cop, right, uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, kind of a cute, funny movie, those kind of things, right? And so I was reminded of the scene in this movie because of what he says, right? He says, stop your, I can't do an Arnold Schwarzenegger voice. <laughs> stop your whining. You're mine now, right? He said, we're going to turn this mushroom into muscles, right? And so I was thinking about this. I was thinking, like, God looks at the Israelites, and sometimes, folks, I'd say he looks at us. And he says this. He says, stop your whining, he says to them, he says to us, you're mine now. I got this, get moving. Can I tell you folks that we might need that? Some of us, maybe we need that today. Maybe we're gonna need that tomorrow. Maybe we're gonna need that by the time we get to the end of 2023. But like, we might need to, this whole idea of to say, like, hey, you know what? You're mine now, quit your whining and move on. I don't know about you, I can, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Essentially, I think in this part of this text, God is saying, knock it off. And, and again, just like a good parent, right? Just like a good parent, he's going he's to say, hey, listen, if you, if, you keep, if you keep it up, right? If you keep your winding up, then, then you're going to lose out, right? Or maybe he got to the point of no return or like you, you've gotten to these places as a parent, right? Where, and, and you're indeed like uh, now uh, something's been taken away, a privilege has been lost, something's going to happen. What I want to suggest to you in this point is that, is that in the context today, what that might mean for us is what if folks, what if we miss out on a miracle that was slated for us, slated for you, slated for me, all because we're just whining and complaining about our life? What if we miss out on a miracle like, I, I, what I want to suggest is that, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is that the reality is I think that the, if, if the Israelites would have kept wanting, they might have missed their miracle. Folks, do you know that we as human beings are really good at whining and complaining? Like, it's like, it's like we, we are born with a PhD in whining. By the way, you don't have to teach a child to whine. They figure it out, right? They do it right out of the, right out of the gate. We're all too skilled, the best at whining and complaining. It comes so natural to us, which we actually see play out with these, the Israelites here. And, and so I was thinking about our lives, and I was trying to think about, like, you know, like, because I think sometimes, right, we can go, well, I'm not that much of a whiner. But let me see if I can actually bring you down a little bit this morning. Right? Because here's the, I, I can think of myself, like, I'm, I'm a pretty upbeat guy. I'm a, those kind of, but, like, I realize like, I'm more of a whiner than I probably I would be willing to admit. Like, for example, like, we whine and complain, say, about the weather. Guilty. <laughs> and by the way, now, uh, he, oh, this verse, I, I hate the fact that this verse is in the Bible, but God directs the weather. It actually says this in Job chapter 37. It says, God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. That's important. He says to the snow, uh, 
fall on the earth. And the rain shower be a mighty downpour. So that's not so good when we, I complain about the weather, something God has his hand in. This week I was like, shoot. I was mad at myself because I was like, I mean, some of you know I hate winter, I hate cold, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, and so like last winter, Leah said, I, I, we were like literally two weeks into winter. And she goes, I can't handle this, another winter of this. You got to stop. Like you can't keep complaining about this. And, she, and then she was like, God put us here because I kept going, God, why didn't you call me to plant a church in Florida, right? She got it. So, like, cause she, and she did. She really helped me. She was like, Matt, you're, you're, by, by complaining as much about the weather, you're actually complaining that God didn't know what he was doing. Right? Some of you aren't loving to be in church this morning. <laughs> so we whine about the weather. Or, or we whine and complain about, uh, this, is an, this happens all the time right now, right? Slow service at a restaurant. By the way, everybody's shorthanded. Or lack of sleep, like we complain about our lack of sleep, and, but, but instead of like actually putting our phone away, we sat and we scrolled in bed for an hour. You know, or we want to complain about our kids or our spouse, or our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our boss, our classmates, our teachers. Man, I tell you what, we can complain so much. My, my children do come home and they complain about their teachers a little bit. I'm sure they're not as bad as what my children are complaining about. Or we, play, we complain about how much money that we don't have, even though in comparison we are vo- so stinking rich compared to the rest of the world. We whine and complain often about really, let's just be real, we comp- complain uh, and whine about any inconvenience that comes our way. Or is that just me? Right? Give me a head nod if you're tracking this morning. Right? We can complain when there's any inconvenience that comes our way. It's all too easy to complain when we are inconvenienced. You know, I actually heard, um, there's actually a, a pastor that I listened to, because pastors also need pastors, so I actually listen to many pastors on Sunday afternoons and evenings. Um, and so, uh, so there's a pastor that I listen to, his, funny enough, his name's Pastor Matt as well. But he said this in the last couple of weeks, he, I'll bring this up. He said, the only consistent thing that we can count on in life is inconsistency. That's it. Which is so true, right? Like, it's, it's so true because we've, many of us, we've lived life left that we know that, like, we can actually have a game plan and then all of a sudden rah, something goes awry, right? Like, the only thing that we can be consistent in is that life is going to be inconsistent. And yet, when we resist inconveniences, or at least I do, and often we can respond like the Israelites in our text and we can just whine about it. And, and what I want to... And what would have happened, folks? What would have happened if the Israelites would have continued whining in this moment? All right, I kind of allude to this. Here's my thought. Let me submit to you that it's possible. It's possible that, that they might have lost out on their, their miracle. They might have lost out on the, the parting of the Red Sea and, 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 and walking across on dry land. What miracle, this is my thought this week, what miracle why, might you or me be missing because we're all too comfortable in our complaining. Interesting thought, I think. What miracle might we be missing out on because we're just comfortable? Because by the way, I, I find myself sometimes being very comfortable in my complaining where I come at, home at the end of the day and, and Lee and I start talking about our day and you know what can be? It can just be a complaint fest. I'm sure we're the only couple that does that. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremiah. I appreciate that. I think sometimes we, I, I can. I can find myself being too focused on the inconvenience rather than what God might be up to. And I think if you thought about it hard enough, you probably might can be willing to admit that yourself. That sometimes our, we're so focused just on the inconvenience rather than going, okay, God, what are you up to? And so I, I was actually trying to think of a, an example of this, and I will, and I will tell you that I, I'm just not great at this. I, when, I, uh, when I get inconvenienced, I'm not usually at my best. And so I was thinking about uh, some friends of ours. I've actually talked about them recently here at the church. Uh, it's Bruce and Shelby Fultinski. This is a, f- a picture of our families together. And uh, they become great friends of Lee and I's. Uh, actually, they're coming over this evening for the Super Bowl. Um, those kind of things. And so, um, but I, I thought about the Faltinskis because I think the Faltinskis embody exactly what I'm trying to get at. And again, they're not perfect at it either, but man, they do it re- pretty well. Um, and and that when, they, when there's an inconvenience, they tend to very much look around and kind of go, okay, God, what are you doing? And so uh, this was kind of showcased uh, for them when uh, over Christmas break, they went to Texas to visit family. And uh, as a part of that, uh, 
like you can bring up the next picture, is a part of that. On the backside of the trip, like many others, they were nine hours in an airport with a nine-month-old and nine-year-old, and their flight got canceled because it was Southwest. And so it got canceled. And uh, so they had to rent a car. Instead of uh, flying home with a couple hours, they had to do a 19-hour drive home from Texas, right? How many of you know that's quite an inconvenience, right? Uh, one, nine hours in an airport, and then 19 hours and all those kind of things. And especially then you got a nine-month-old and a nine-year-old to boot, right? Like this is quite an inconvenience. But what I, what I found interesting and intriguing as I watched this all play out on social media, uh, and we were texting with them and those kind of things, is that, is that, man, I tell you what, along the way, Shelby made some posts that I thought were kind of interesting and exactly the opposite of probably what I would have done. Uh, take a look at a couple of them. The first one was this. I'll come up on the screen. I'll read this to you in case you can't read it. It says, when you pass, this is after they've left and they're driving, they hit the road, right? Quote, it says, when you pass a super cool drive through light show on the highway, you absolutely turn around and drive through. We would have totally missed Santa land had not they had the opportunity to drive home together. Super cool. Did you hear it in her words? Like almost excitement for an inconvenience. She used the word opportunity to drive home. I wouldn't have said that was an opportunity. <laughs> A little while later, she made this post. Our, our adventure continues. We are grateful that our sweet girl slept soundly all night as Bruce and I drove. We stopped for a delicious breakfast this morning at a small, look at this. This was a place called Small Town with Big Things. Lord willing, we only have three more hours until we get to Chicago where our vehicle's parked and then a couple more hours to finally home. And then listen to this, just to think, we would have missed out on all these big things. I thought it was a pretty cool response because I'm like, I'll tell you what, man, when, if, if, when, when I get inconvenienced, especially if it would have been a 19-hour drive inconvenience, my family doesn't want to be around me. And yet you got Shelby and Bruce saying, hey, yeah, let's stop at the, like, I don't stop on road trips anyways, let alone to see a light show when I get inconvenienced, Right? And so I think that the, the, the Voltinskis do a really good job looking around and seeing. Now, now, you might not think that and consider those things that they walk through as miracles, but can I tell you that they absolutely do? Because, by the way, if you didn't know that time, during, if, if you were on a Southwest flight, you, you pretty much got canceled. You couldn't go anywhere unless you rented a car, and rental cars were very really sparse because the reality is everybody was doing it. So the fact that they got a rental car in the first place was, uh, was a miracle to them. And the fact that their girls, their two girls, didn't freak out in 19 hours miracle, right? The, the, and the fact that they were, they were safe the whole way and got to experience all these things, those are miracles. And, 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 and then here's the crazy thing, they had fun along the way because they were focused on more on what God was doing rather than what challenges they were facing. Can I say something? This, this, and I thought about this. I want to be like the Faltinskis when I grow up. I do. Often, like I said, I, when I'm inconvenienced, man, like I'm irritable and, and rash and frustrated. And so I so desire, I want God to transform Matt in such a way that when I'm inconvenienced, I look around and say, hey, God, what are you doing? My guess is there's probably some of you that want more of that too. And I think that that's where when we can go, draw close to God and in the Holy Spirit in us, right? Like those are those places where, where that can be a transformative thing inside of us. And, and, and the reality is, is that uh, like, I think that um, it's, it's what God would want from us, by the way. Because if you don't, again, the only thing in life that is consistent is inconsistency. And so if we don't figure this out, we're just going to live life really frustrated, I think we see God poke the Israelites here on this point. Again, it says in verse 15 in the living, it says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. So I want you to write this statement in on your handout. I think we more often need to do this. I think we need to more often focus on what God is doing rather than what challenges we are facing. Because if we do that, Folks, if we can focus on what God is doing rather than the challenge that we are facing, the reality is we might actually, it might just reveal the miracle that we're looking for. By the way, the, the Israelites needed this miracle. If we focus on what God is doing, it might actually reveal the miracle that we're looking for rather than us missing it or be taken away from us. Philippians chapter two, verses 14 and 15 says, look at this. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing except for the things at work. It doesn't say that. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become, this is important, blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. 
And then 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Well, that's pretty serious. Talk about the opposite of a miracle. There, I think there's, there's something to this whole thing, and I think it's what, one of the thing, things that I was kind of feeling that the Lord was revealing to me as I was studying this text is the reality is that experiencing a miracle might just take less whining, embracing what's going on, looking for what God is doing, which is our first point today. And then our second point, you can write this down. Experiencing a miracle might require trusting God with our enemies. You write that down, trusting God with our enemies. I'm going to unpack this. And what I mean by that, but uh, you, you might have guessed that this actually deals, this uh, point deals with the major part of the story, the miracle itself, right? The, the parting of the Red Sea, it opening up for the Israelites, they get to walk across on dry land, and well, not so much for the Egyptians, right? And so just to remind us of what's happening, look again at verses 21 and 22. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all in the night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And so God was doing something miraculous. I don't know about you. I've never seen a wall of water just whoop like that. Like maybe you've seen that in like Bruce Almighty when he like does that with the soup, you know. But it looked a little something like this. Take a look at these couple of photos, right? And, and so there was a like literally like he just puts out the staff and whoo, walls of water, right? And they walk across a wall on the left, a wall on the right. Right, pretty incredible. Like something, it kind of looks something like that, and, and 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 like super incredible. But then the text goes on in verse twenty-five. After the Israelites make it across, and the Egyptians begin to follow them and come across as well. It says in verse twenty-five, it says that the Lord jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And then verse twenty-seven, the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them. Survived, And so the, what I took from this is, folks, God took care of their enemies. God took care of their enemies. Maybe, maybe a way for us to experience a, a, a more of a miracle in our life is that trusting God with our enemies rather than us attempting to do it on our own. Letting God fight our battles for us rather than us fight our own battles. Maybe that's a way to experience more of a miracle. Remember, Moses even tells them, which I think is advice to us too, right? He tells them in verse 14 of the text, a great verse, by the way. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be what? Still. You need only to be still. And maybe, maybe there's something to this letting God fight our battles thing. Maybe, uh, what, what, if, what if we're missing a miracle because we're all too often taking things into our own hands. I think it's an interesting thought to think about. And so as I kind of pondered that this week, I was like, okay, like, you know, I want to give up all full, full of every bit of my life over to God and all those kind of things. And so, yeah, I can kind of track that. But like, maybe you're like me this week and you're like, okay, like, I can kind of track that. I need to give this part of my, my life to God, even my enemies and all that. But, but how do you do that? What does that look like? And as I thought about that this week, I had three thoughts, three hints from Scripture that I want to share with you. And I actually have you write these down. And I think these are just helpful hints. Um, maybe it looks like this. The first one is this, a silent defense. Maybe it's a silent defense. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 23, says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And so I, I like this verse because it, it showcases the fact that Jesus doesn't say anything when they hurled insults at him. He doesn't retaliate. He, when he suffered, he made no threats. Sometimes, folks, if we take a cue from Jesus, right, uh, that ultimately says that, that, uh, he, that we could follow in his footsteps, he's leaving us an example, right? If we can take a cue from Jesus, maybe our, 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 uh, the best defense is a silent one. Letting God, who, as this text says, judges justly, maybe we let him work things out. Sometimes, if I can say this lovingly, sometimes we just need to shut up. How many of you know that's hard for Matt Foreman? That's hard for me. But I will tell you, so hard, and, and, but something as I was challenged this week about, man, like, if, 
I am, I am 100% sure that I have missed a miracle in my life because I just decided to talk too much. Some of you might be in the same boat. You, you probably missed a miracle because you just you talked too much. You took matters into your own hands. It, we, we, we were defensive in our own defense rather than letting God defend us. And so one of the things that I pray because of that, because it's too hard for me sometimes, uh, I pray pretty frequently in my Bible time in the morning is actually something from something that I gave to some of you. If you were here sometime this last year, I gave you uh, a bookmark that looked like this. And uh, on it, it actually has the 29 things, uh, rights to yield to God in our lives. That's from uh, pastor speaker, uh, Tom Harmon. And uh, on here, number seven is, uh, it says, I yield my rights to defend myself. And so every morning when I'm in my Bible time, I will pray through these and I will tell God, I said, God, I will yield my right to defend myself again this morning because you are the defender of me. Because I want to be like Jesus. I, I, want, I, I don't want to have to speak things out if I don't need to speak things out. Because in the end, God took care of his enemies, Jesus' enemies, and folks, he will take care of your enemies. Exodus 23, 22, this is later in the book of Exodus, says, if you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. If we do it his way, God's way, he will take care of our enemies like he did with the Israelites. Maybe letting God fight our battles looks like a silent defense. Which I know, by the way, with social media and everything else right now and Twitter and everybody's blah, 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 vomiting everywhere, that's kind of a, a cultural, like, completely sh- a complete shift to where our culture's going. But man, I tell you what, I think it's biblical. In order, so, so at the end of the day, like, and I don't want to live my life just because I've received things, but man, I tell you what, I, I, I want to live my life in much more of a silent defense when I'm supposed to so that ultimately I can see, experience, and walk in more miracles in my life. My guess is probably you want that too. So I think something to think about. Second thing, helpful hint that came to mind this week from Scripture uh, regards to trusting God with their enemies. Fill this in. Maybe it looks like taking more. Maybe it looks like taking more. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39, it says, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And so maybe, maybe uh, trusting God with our enemies isn't just a, a silent defense, but maybe it's to endure more from others than we already are. This is, by the way, uh, this lesson, this is from Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew's uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And, and this is basically saying, uh, through this whole Sermon on the Mount, he's being, hey, the law said this, and this is what everybody thinks is right, and all those things. But then, then Jesus said, hey, let me, let me flip this thing upside down. Let me turn this on its head. By the way, he did that a lot. And he's basically saying, so, hey, how about this? How about, yeah, the law says eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but what if for a time being, what if for a time being, we're, you, you let your enemy have their moment, let, their, let your enemy have their day, turn the other cheek, so to speak, in order to let God of the universe take care of things. By the way, if you don't know, as followers of Jesus, we are not always supposed to win. Actually, often we're called to lose. And so the reality is, like, uh, like, this is a call on our lives and, and to leave things to God. It says in Romans chapter 12, it says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So there's a call to let God take, and then you got other verses instead, like uh, Luke 6, 27, that says this, it says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Sort of kind of like, kill them with kindness, instead of re- taking retaliation, kill them with kindness. Be, the, be like super crazy, nice, and loving. How many of you know that's counterculture right now? So maybe trusting God with our enemies looks like taking more. Now, I wanted to be very clear. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that here that God wants us to remain in an abusive situation or just deal with it. I mean, we see situations all the time in the Old Testament. Now, for example, like with David and Saul in uh, second, first and second Samuel, I would encourage you to read those, those books of the Bible, right, if you don't know this story. Um, but, but basically, literally, Saul is trying to kill David. 
and David flees. Okay? Read the whole story out, though, and here's the reality, though. Even though David fled, the reality is, is that David still had a quite a bit to endure in the story. He had to take on some stuff to accomplish what God was up to with Saul, his enemy. Sometimes, folks, we just need to trust God to take, and, and we can take more and we can endure more and let him do what he's going to do with our enemies. Let him work it all out. Let, and by, by letting him work it all out, can I just tell you, I guarantee you, because of what the scripture says, I guarantee you you're going to see more miracles in your life. Because God is a God of miracles. When we let him actually do stuff, he actually shows up and does stuff, believe it or not. So that's the second thing. Finally, maybe trusting God with our enemies looks like talking about them. Now, I know that might sound a little weird, but what I mean is talking about, by talking about them is talking, to, talking about them with God. To pray about them, to pray for them, to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray. Luke 6, 28 says, bless those who curse you. And then here it is, and pray for those who mistreat you. Bless those who curse you. Again, that's kind of the kill them with kindness thing. And pray for those who mistreat you. We need to hand them, as well as the situation, over to God. Pray blessings over them, not curses over them. Literally putting them in the hands of God to do with what and how he wants to do that. Now, that said, some of you know I'm doing my, I've mentioned this over the last couple of weeks, I'm doing my Bible time in the book of Psalms. I'm almost done with the book of Psalms. By the way, the Psalms is a long book of the Bible. And so I'm almost done with the Psalms, and I was reading this week uh, in Psalms 140. With, it's, this is a, kind of a, an entire prayer against an enemy. And I read this verse, and I was like, ooh, that's interesting. Verse 9 says, Let the heart, heads of those who surround me be covered with the trouble their lips have caused. And I was like, whoa, what? I took note of that. I wrote it down. Let the heads of those who surround me be covered with the trouble their lips have caused. And so, yes, we should be praying blessings over our enemies. But if, if, we, uh, if they are indeed uh, causing challenges for us simply because of the fact that we are their enemy, there may be certain situations where our prayers can be like this one. That God would turn back the troubles that they are causing on themselves. Not to curse them, right? That's, a, that's an important distinction. Not to curse those people, but ultimately to hopefully wake them up to the reality of what they are doing, what they are saying, or what the pain they are causing, right? I've actually had moments in my life where there are people that I absolutely love and I care for, and I've pray, prayed for their lives to get harder. So ultimately they would see what God is doing. And that's not a cursing prayer, that is a blessing prayer because the only way that some people are gonna figure out what's going on is things get harder in their life. Regardless though, overall, what we need to do, I think, is to hand over to God our enemies, put them in the hands of God to do with what he wants and how he wants, living out verse 14 of the text, right? That says, let the Lord fight for you. You need only to be still. God, by the way, has this. There's not a single thing on this planet that God doesn't have the opportunity and ability to put his hand in. He's got this. This part of our, the, uh, our text today might just be the thing that we might need to do to, end, to actually see the miracles that we are looking for and we need in our lives. Because experiencing a miracle indeed might require trusting God with our enemies and specifically what I just covered, right? A silent defense, mm, that's hard. Taking more, talking about our enemies to God. And I wanna say this, I know like when I, when I stand up here and preach, you're like, oh Matt, yeah, that's not real easy. I know it's not easy. Look, I know it's not easy. I mean, the whole talking thing is not easy for me. But I think this is a lesson that we see from the Israelites along with in general, less whining in our lives. It, my, my thought this week was like, man, if we, could, if we could actually get these things figured out, if we could whine less and we could ultimately just trust God to do, take care of our enemies like the Israelites did, let them, man, I think that we, we might see more positive outcomes in our lives. We might see more miracles. We, we might, see, uh, we might we, be living more of the life that God would want us to live. But I think if you're like me, man, I take, the, I take this stuff into my own hands way too much. And I try, to, I try in my effort to figure it out. I think the Lord wants us to continue just to give it all to him, back to him, let him kind of deal with all this stuff. So I think hopefully there's some things for you to consider today. Um, so with that, why don't you stand? And we're going to move into a time of responsive worship.